Good morning and welcome to worship. Our plan for worship today is to walk through what our hymnal calls the service. The service is a set of words and actions which we usually use at church when we gather for the main worship experience of the week. Some of what we do today will be familiar and we'll explain a few things that are new. But our real purpose today isn't to review what we know or introduce what we don't know. Our real purpose is to help everyone understand more completely what we're doing and why we do it when we come together for worship. The word, the word worship means to adore and praise God. And the highest praise a Christian can offer God is to proclaim what God has done for us in Christ. And so at worship, the minister and the people retell the good news about Jesus we say and we sing that God forgives our sins and the sins of the world for Jesus' sake. Everything we do in worship involves us with the gospel. In this way, we encourage others with the gospel while others encourage us. Christians have generally followed an order of service. We catch a glimpse of that order in Jerusalem in the weeks after Pentecost. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer our order of worship follows that first century pattern. We worship in an orderly and organized way so that everyone may hear and understand the gospel without being distracted. We repeat the most important gospel truths so that they become embedded in our minds and hearts. Variety helps us review the many facets of the gospel. We adopt and adapt ancient and widespread practices of the church to remember the gospel unity we have with all believers. We proclaim the message of Christ in language, music, art, and symbolism, which touch our hearts but do not outshine the gospel. The service begins with a hymn, which often directs our attention to the focus of worship on a particular day. The hymn brings us together as a worshiping congregation. It may even brush away a few cobwebs from tired brains. Please join to sing Christian worship hymn number 824. This is the Threefold Truth. The word of baptism is in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
These are the words spoken to us as we were baptized with water. The sign is the cross which we received at our baptism. Receive the sign of the cross on the head and heart to mark you as a re one redeemed by Christ the crucified. We come before God in worship as people who have been covered by the righteous robes of Christ and members of the family of God. What joy and confidence we have as we worship. We say, Amen. Truly, we agree. We remember our baptism in confession as we drown our sinful nature and gain the life-renewing work of the Spirit. We confess to God and one another that we were born in sin and that we sin every day. With our brothers and sisters in faith, we plead for forgiveness for the sake of Jesus. The words we speak become so familiar that we can repeat them from memory. And when we wake up and when we get ready for sleep, in these words we also proclaim to one another what we believe about sin and grace. The minister then absolves us. He forgives our sins. The absolution is one of the simplest forms of gospel proclamation in our worship. The minister forgives us not on his own, but as a called servant of Christ, whom we and the Spirit have called to speak the words of God to us. We can hear these words with confidence, for Jesus said to his disciples on the evening of his resurrection, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. Again we say, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Prayer often introduced Old Testament worship, and the early Christians continued the custom of beginning their gathering with a responsive prayer. We do the same. The minister invites us to pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. And we pray, Lord, have mercy. As we gather to hear the word and receive the sacrament, we implore God to keep all believers in his grace and protect us by his mercy. Both the responsive prayer and the song that follows include alternate titles. Kyrie is Greek for Lord, and Gloria in Excelsis is Latin for glory in the highest. The ancient titles remind us that Christians have sung these songs for centuries in countless musical settings. These two song texts and three others, which we'll identify later, are from a set of songs called The Ordinary. The words of these five songs repeat the most important teachings of the gospel, and that's why we repeat them at almost every service. Glory be to God on high combines three ancient hymns. You'll recognize the first as the song the angels sang on the fields of Bethlehem. This hymn, sometimes called a canticle, proclaims Jesus Christ as the center of God's plan to save the world. We sing it often because it's worth remembering and memorizing. A similar canticle, This is the Feast, may replace it during the Easter season. During Advent, many congregations replace it with the canticle Benedictus of, or the Song of Zechariah to prepare for the Christmas celebration. Some congregations omit this song during the more somber seasons of Advent. And let. Please stand for the Lord have mercy. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. 
for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. You may be seated. In the early church, hearing the word and receiving the sacrament were separated by a time for fellowship. Each service began with a greeting, the Lord be with you, the minister said, and the people responded, and also with you. We'll see this greeting again at the beginning of the communion service. Now we come to the word section of the service. We see it in large letters in the hymnal, the word. When the early Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, they were eager to hear about the words and works of Jesus. The apostles were the Savior's witnesses and had heard and seen Jesus in person. The service follows that pattern. It highlights the words and works of Jesus in a reading from one of the four Gospels. A unique feature of our order of service is what we call the proper, a set of readings, prayers, psalms, and hymns that focus on the main truth of the day's Gospel. As the truth in the Gospel changes from week to week and on the various festivals of the year, the proper changes too. The gospel accounts and their proper are guided by the Christian calendar or church year. Over the course of centuries, Christian churches developed a plan to review the words and works of Christ every year. We divide the calendar into two parts, the time of Christ and the time of the church. The time of Christ, which our hymnal divides into the time of Christmas and the time of Easter, occurs between late November and May. It focuses, us, focuses on the main events of Jesus' life and so includes the seasons of Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, and Easter. It ends with the day of Pentecost and Sunday of the Holy Trinity. The time of the church focuses on words. Jesus spoke during his ministry to guide us in our lives as Christians. The proper for today is the proper appointed for this Sunday in the church year. The proper begins with the prayer of the day. The minister invites the congregation to bring this prayer to God. Let us pray, he says. The prayer requests the blessings that are going to be given in the readings and the sermon on this day. There are three readings in the service. The first reading is usually from the Old Testament and helps us to see the, that the words and the works of Jesus in the gospel for the day were promised and applied even before he came to earth. Worshippers become involved in the reading by responding to the minister's concluding sentence, the word of the Lord. Worshippers say with joy, thanks be to God. The book of Psalms was the hymnal of the Old Testament and is filled with praises and prayers about God's great love. The psalm of the day matches the theme of the days of the day's gospel and enables worshipers to proclaim the word of God in music and to take their turn to declare the wonders God has done. The second reading is from one of the New Testament letters, the epistles. This reading also complements the theme of the day's gospel. Again, worshipers respond with thanks after hearing the word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God and Father, help us to remember Jesus, who obeyed your will and bore the cross for our salvation, that through his anguish, pain, and death, we may receive the forgiveness of sins, victory over the grave, and finally inherit eternal life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading for today is indeed from the Old Testament, from 2 Kings chapter 4. In these words, we hear the miracle of a prophet named Elisha raising a boy from the dead, a boy that had been given by a special promise to this woman. But the woman became pregnant, and the next year, about that same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. The child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. He said to his father, my head, my head. His father told the servant, carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. He went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. That's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, lead on, don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. 
When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, Look, there's the Shumanite. Run to meet her and ask her, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything's all right, she said. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, Leave her alone. She's in bitter distress. But the Lord has hidden from me it from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord, she said? Didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes? Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt, take my staff in your hand and run. Don't greet anyone you meet. And if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. Gazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy has not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, and hands to hands. As he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite. And he said, when he came, he said, take your son. She came in, fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join now in singing the appointed Psalm of the Days, 130b.
Our epistle reading for this morning is taken from the Apostle Paul's letter to the believers in Rome. In these words, we hear about how the fact is, right now in this world, we do share in the sufferings of Christ, but we do that so that one day we may also share in his glory. We read from Romans 8. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, for the creation awaits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The reading of the gospel is the highlight of the word section of the service. The truth announced in the day's gospel was guided by, guided, has guided the prayer of the day, the two readings and the psalm. Now it will set the tone for the hymn of the day and the sermon. More importantly, in these words, the holy evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, proclaim to us what Jesus said and what Jesus did to save us from sin, Satan, death, and hell. We honor Jesus by standing. In the gospel acclamation, we offer our alleluias. We sing, praise the Lord. In the more somber season of Lent, many congregations omit the alleluias. The acclamation includes a sentence which points to the theme of the day's gospel. Please stand for that gospel acclamation. Our gospel for today is from John chapter 11. Not long before Jesus would show his power over death in his own resurrection, he showed that power over death by raising his friend Lazarus. On his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Jesus, once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad order, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called him in a loud, called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had, and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. 
Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Martin Luther considered, is considered by many to be the father of the congregational song, and so hymns have always been an important part of Lutheran worship. The hymn of the day was chosen specifically to match the theme of the gospel and was selected from the best hymns in our hymnal. The hymn is worth getting to know well. And now we'll sing that hymn of the day, hymn 571. no traditional sermon in today's service. These explanations serve as the sermon. The sermon is one of the great legacies of the Lutheran Reformation. 
The reformers restored the value and importance of preaching, and we feel the same. After a careful study and thorough preparation, the servant of the Lord explains and applies one of the three readings appointed for the day. He proclaims the law and the gospel in light of Jesus' words and works in focus on the day. He exposes sin, he announces forgiveness, and he encourages our life response. He shares with us the words of God that he believes himself. We thank God for preaching that speaks for God and touches our minds and hearts. The sermon is the last part of the proper for the day. In prayers, psalms, hymns, readings, and the spoken word, we have devoted ourselves to the words and works of Jesus recorded in the day's gospel. At this point, we stand to speak the creed, and we confess that we believe what we have heard in the word about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The creed is the third song text of the historic ordinary. You see the Latin word credo, which means I believe. Like the Kyrie and Gloria, the credo was sung for centuries. Today, our custom is to speak it. Please stand for that creed. We confess our Christian faith with the ancient believers. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. As we noted earlier, the first Christians paused after hearing the word, after to, or often to share a meal. Those with more wealth may have provided food for those with less. And believers offered prayers for one another. The prayer of the church enables believers to practice their Christian fellowship by praying for all sorts of people and all kinds of activities. We add the names of fellow members who are enduring trouble and enjoying special times in their lives. Responsive prayers involve both the minister and the congregation. Since the prayer may include a number of intercessions, worshipers are seated. The Lord often encourages us to manage his monetary gifts wisely and he especially calls on us to be generous in our support of gospel ministry. We plan our gifts at home and may even give via online devices, including the offering in worship helps us remember that we give our offerings to the Lord and for the spread of his good news in our own congregation and around the world. The music during the offering may bring to mind the words of a familiar hymn. The quieter time also enables minister and members to prepare for the sacrament. We now continue with that responsive prayer of the church. Heavenly Father, you have loved the world and gave your Son to free us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We confess that without your love we are lost. Lord of the church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you, no matter what the danger or the cost. Guard and guide those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom, missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and values as Christians. By your spirit, O Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Keep in your care those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, 
the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict in personal relationships, and those victimized by war and injustice. Comfort all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy, be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. Watch over those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Strengthen them in their work, O Lord, and do not let them become weary in doing good. Hear us as we pray in silence. We keep in our prayers the three men who hold calls to Zion right now. Be with them and give them wisdom as they deliberate their calls. Whatever decision you lead them to make, we ask that you would continue to bless them as they continue to work for the purposes of your holy kingdom. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death, that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We now have an opportunity to worship our God with our first fruits. Thank you, choir. The second main part of the service begins with this same greeting that began the word, the word section, the Lord be with you. The minister says, and the worshipers return his greeting, and also with you. The words that follow are found in Christian orders of service already in the third century. As they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, believers carefully imitated the actions of the first holy meal as the apostles remembered them. With few exceptions, we do the same. As we lift our hearts to the Lord, the minister invites us to give thanks as Jesus did. 
The fourth canticle of the historic ordinary introduces the prayer of thanksgiving, holy, 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 entitled Sanctus in Latin. The words lead <coughs> us into the throne room of God as Isaiah saw it with wonder and awe, where there we go to Palm Sunday and praise Jesus who is coming to us in the sacrament. We sing Hosanna, a Hebrew word that means save us, Lord. For most of us, the prayer of thanksgiving is a new feature in the service. Martin Luther eliminated the medieval form of this prayer since it was filled with false teaching. But Lutherans have crafted new prayers that are faithful to the scriptures. The prayer of thanksgiving concludes with the Lord's Prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God, to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. We give thanks to you, O God, through your Son, dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the Messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your son's body and blood. Send us your spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this point, we hear the actions Jesus took and the words he spoke on the night he first offered the holy meal, the words of institution. These words of consecration, together with the distribution of the elements and the reception by the communicants, are the critical elements of the sacrament. We believe that we receive the true body and blood of Christ under the bread and wine when the elements are consecrated, distributed, and received. With the peace of the Lord on our minds and in our hearts, we join in the last canticle of the ordinary. O Christ, Lamb of God, the Agnus Dei, Lamb of God in Latin. We are not surprised that believers have sung these words for centuries. Have mercy on us and grant us your peace. We approach the altar full of confident joy. As the minister communes us, he identifies the body and blood we are receiving for the forgiveness of sins. He bids us to go in peace, believing in the blessing we have received from Christ. Please stand for the words of the institution. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he also took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
our worship for this day has come to an end with thanksgiving, prayer, and the blessing. One last time, the triune God confers on us his blessing, grace, and peace. One last time, we exclaim, Amen. The service has provided us with opportunities to remember our baptisms, hear the word of God, and receive the sacrament. These are the means of grace the Holy Spirit uses to call, gather, enlighten, and sanctify the whole Christian church on earth. As ministers, musicians, artists, and worshipers, we do our best to wrap the gospel in fitting words, beautiful music, meaningful symbols, and lovely buildings that touch our hearts. But what is most important is the proclamation of the gospel. Worshipers and ministers have come together to praise God by proclaiming the gospel in word and sacrament. We come to worship for the gospel, and with that gospel, we depart to serve and witness. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for our final hymn, Jerusalem the Golden. Thank you. 